We didn't know. Um, something about Let's Chris rock Wallace. Let's Another big oh, hour that's coming what up. You had on. <laughs> right on. Good morning. Happy Friday. Good I'm morning. Bill Hemmer. President about, uh, well, we, we expect him to recertify this Iran deal. It hasn't happened yet. After meeting yesterday with the Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and Defense Secretary James Mattis, all this as Iran cracks down on protests with reports the regime has arrested thousands 4,000, in fact. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin saying that new sanctions could be on the way. Are you expecting uh, any new sanctions on Iran to come from Treasury? I am expecting new sanctions uh, on Iran. We continue to uh, look at them. We've rolled them out, and I think it's, uh, you can expect there will be more sanctions coming. Rich Hudson is live at the State Department. All this keeps the United States in the Iran nuclear deal. Good morning, Rich. Yeah, good morning, Sandra. And that's the decision today. Is the United States in or out of the Iran nuclear agreement? We're expecting the administration to continue lifting sanctions against Iran as they relate to the nuclear agreement, but then extend other sanctions outside of the framework. This is a strategy, the result of conversations that began, according to officials, uh, at the beginning of last uh, weekend at Camp David, then continued through the White House through the week. So this is how it essentially works. The president, to keep the United States in the Iran nuclear agreement, has to continue waiving sanctions related to the Iran nuclear agreement. That's the U.S. end of the bargain. So if the president does that, he can also increase sanctions outside the Iran nuclear deal. The administration has done that before, and as Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, said, the U.S. will continue doing that again. Uh, that's for Iran's ballistic missile launches, its uh, support of extremism and terrorism around the region. The administration will continue doing that. So it can increase sanctions and keep the U.S. in the deal at the same time, Sandra. And, Rich, the president indicating he's open to talking to North Korea? Yeah, the president uh, suggesting that perhaps he would have a good relationship with the North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. This is the result of an interview that he did with the Wall Street Journal. In that publication, he said, quote, I probably have a very good relationship with Kim Jong-un. I have relationships with people. I think you people are surprised. The journal asked if he had spoken to Kim Jong-un. The president refused to comment, saying he won't say if he has or if he hasn't. Now, the official line from the United States on negotiations with North Korea is that North Korea and the Kim Jong-un regime must substantially change their behavior. They have to stop launching ballistic missiles. They have to stop testing nuclear weapons and show that they are willing to discuss their nuclear weapons program because the U.S. goal here is to get rid of North, uh, North Korea's nuclear weapons. Thus far, officials say there is no signal they have done so. Back to you. All right, Rich Edson at the State Department for us. Thank you. Watch that story. Watch this one, too. A group of senators, Republicans and Democrats working on a DACA deal will go back to the drawing board after the president rejected their initial proposal. The president meeting with senators yesterday and now denying he made derogatory comments about immigrants from certain countries during those talks. Here's the White House Director of Strategic Communications, Mercedes Schlapp, just about 15 minutes ago here on our program. We want to see merit-based system. I mean, that's very clear that what we, the system we have right now is that one in 15 immigrants that are coming into this country uh, are the ones that are coming, that have skills. We need to change that. We need to allow for a system where we're able to match the skills of the immigrants coming in uh, to then match what we need in terms of contributing to the economy, as well as ensuring that we don't depress wages. All right, that was Mercedes Slap a moment ago. Dick Durbin's a Democratic from uh, Center from Illinois. Mike Emanuel, that's, that's who you see right there. Dick Durbin, apparently speaking in Chicago moments ago, was in that meeting. He says the president did use it. Uh, nonetheless, Mike, let's talk about what we know about the agreement in principle. Have they gotten an agreement in principle among senators? Well, Bill, among a small group, senators who have been working this issue for four months, trying to come up with a deal for these young people brought to this country illegally by their parents. Senators Graham, Durbin, Flake, Bennett, Gardner, and Menendez say they all have a plan and are now selling it to their colleagues. We've come up with an idea. We're not going to share it with you yet because we want to share it with our colleagues to see if we can get more Republicans and more Democrats behind the proposal. I think that will matter to the president. The president conducted himself very well a couple of days ago. He talked about secure borders and compassion. But the White House and leading conservatives were quick to say there is no deal and they'll likely need more time. If it continues to allow chain migration, the effect of that would be amnesty for millions of people here illegally. That's, that's fundamentally inconsistent with what we promised the American people. And I don't think it's made better 
by a few token or fig leaf border security measures. Six yes votes in the Senate is a start, but they need 60 to pass a bill. Uh, so, okay, so what are the talks right now taking place trying to tackle? Um, how, how, would you, how would you line up the issues there, Mike? Well, well, the one endorsed by the White House is bipartisan with top players from the House and Senate. That group is Kevin McCarthy and Steny Hoyer from the House and John Cornyn and Dick Durbin from the Senate. And top Democrats note President Trump also wants a deal. He supports the Dreamers, DACA, he calls it. Uh, that's okay. And um, wants to have some border security. We all know we have a responsibility to secure our border, so we could find our common ground there. But that's all possible. I, I think people of goodwill are coming together on both sides of the aisle, both houses of Congress, to get the job done. House buy-in is critical. Immigration reform in 2013 passed the Senate, but then died in the House. Well, so. Thank you, Mike. Follow it for us, okay? Going to need you yes, next sir. week. Mike Emanuel there in Washington. Sandra. Joining me now to discuss all of this, Chris Wallace, anchor of Fox News Sunday. Chris, good morning to you. Good morning to you, Sandra. So what's everybody talking about in Washington this morning? <laughs> well, uh, the president's remarks. And uh, I say, you know, he alleges that he didn't make the remarks. But you know, somebody who covered a White House for six years, you really have to, to, to fine tune. And the specific thing that he denies that he said was, why do we need more Haitians? Get them out. He has not specifically denied his very incendiary remark about <clears throat> why the, the, we don't need more people from these S-hole countries. And that, of course, is the, uh, the remark that has caused a firestorm. And as you just pointed out, Dick Durbin, who was in the meeting, the number two Democrat in the Senate, says the president is lying, and he did make those remarks. That's right. So he's speaking at an MLK breakfast in Chicago this morning. Uh, once we are able to turn around those comments, we'll bring those to our audience. Um, for now, here's how the president is going on the record with this this morning, Chris. He, in his most recent tweet, says, quote, never said anything derogatory about Haitians, other than Haiti is obviously a very poor and troubled country. Never said take them out. Made up by Dems. I have a wonderful relationship with Haitians. Probably should re record future meetings. Unfortunately, no trust. That brings up a couple questions. Will there be a change? Will we see more TV cameras in the president's meetings? Um, and second, I, I wonder, Chris, if we're going to hear more from the president as the day goes on, because this clearly is not clearing things up this morning, his tweets. No, and, and look, you, you just have to use some common sense here. The president made these remarks. The meeting with Dick Durbin and other people uh, was yesterday morning in the Oval Office. Uh, the, the word very quickly got out. Remember, this wasn't a meeting of the inner group at the White House. Dick Durbin was there. No love lost between him and the president. He quickly, or somebody on the Democratic side, probably quickly put out what the president had said. They had, what, I think it's now been about 18 hours since then to specifically deny it. It was all over cable news last night on all the channels, uh, and it, it was never denied. The only thing that the White House said was that some politicians fight for foreign countries. This president fights for America. Very praiseworthy statement, but it, doesn't, it didn't in any way deny the comments that the president allegedly had made. So just common sense, you've got to say, if he didn't say it, and it was such an incendiary remark. Why wouldn't they have denied it right away? It took until the president tweeted this morning. All right. So, again, once we have those comments from Durbin, Durbin we'll bring them. But Democrats are not uh, without criticism, criticism this morning either, Chris. Nancy Pelosi said some interesting things um, about those five white guys uh, talking about getting a deal done. Those, the five white guys, I called them, you know. Um, she said, are they going to open a hamburger stand next or what? And that is not going over with some, including Steny Hoyer, who took offense to that, saying the comment's offensive. I'm committed to ensuring dreamers are protected, and I'm welcome anyone who wants to come to the table to get this done. Nancy Pelosi's uh, joke, I guess, some are saying that it was, didn't go over so well. No, it was a dumb remark. Uh, it was representative of the identity politics that Democrats play, that instead of talking about these five individuals who are having this meeting, it was, you know, the top vote counters in the House and the Senate, both Republican and Democrat, and also uh, the chief of staff, John Kelly, at the White House. Uh, it was a dumb remark, and, uh, but I got to say, 
it, 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 in all fairness, it was, it's a parking ticket compared to mm -hmm. what the president allegedly said. Uh, so, Chris, we've, we've got the sound of Dick Durbin speaking at this MLK breakfast in Chicago this morning. He was in the room yesterday when President Trump made those remarks and said that word. And fair warning to our audience, Durbin does say the word in this soundbite. Let's listen. When I mentioned that fact to him, he said, Haitians, do we need more Haitians? And then he went on when we started to describe the immigration from Africa that was being protected in this uh, bipartisan measure. That's when he used these vile and vulgar comments, calling the nations they come from shitholes. The exact word used by the president, not more, not just once, but repeatedly. Uh, that was the nature of this conversation. When it came to the issue of, quote, chain migration, I said to the president, do you realize how painful that term is to so many people? That was Senator Dick Durbin just a few moments ago in Chicago. Chris, I'll remind everybody, the president says he did not use that language. Dick Durbin was in the room and he says he did. Yeah, well, again, the president has not specifically denied that. He has specifically denied that he said, why do we need more Haitians? Get them out on the S-hole remark. Uh, he has not specifically denied that. He just said, I didn't use the language that they quoted. Uh, but again, only specifically, was only the remark about the Haitians. You know, it's, it's kind of an extraordinary moment when we have to caution viewers about language that the president mm. apparently said in the Oval Office, writing off uh, whole countries, including a whole continent, Africa. Uh, it's pretty extraordinary. And the big question, does, does this give Democrats more leverage going into next week? Does this derail efforts to get immigration reform done? Chris Wallace, I have a couple seconds left. Last word. Yeah, real, real quickly, yeah. It does make it more complicated. And that's, you know, for, people have their own views of President Trump, and they'll continue to have those views. But this is going to make it harder for Democrats to agree to a deal on DACA, and which they say has to be agreed to before they agree to keep funding the government. And funding for the government runs out at midnight mm -hmm. tonight, uh, a week from tonight. A week from tonight. Uh, Chris Wallace will watch Fox News Sunday this weekend. Thank you so much for coming on this morning. You bet. Thank you, Sandra. Check him out. This Sunday, 12 minutes past, Senator Rand Paul taking House Speaker Paul Ryan to task over reauthorizing the FISA Act. He said that, uh, this rather, last hour here. The best way I can describe what he said is disingenuous. We don't stop any of the collection of the data. We reauthorize a program in the Amash Amendment, the Paul Wyden Amendment. We reauthorize a program. We never interrupt the collection of foreign data on foreigners. So he's threatening to take action as the measure now moves to the Senate. Sean Duffy is live on his reaction coming up here. Also, top Democrat Nancy Pelosi calling bonuses as a result of tax reform crumbs. What do you think about that, America? In terms of the bonus that corporate America received versus the crumbs that they are giving to workers to kind of put the schmooze on is so pathetic. It's so pathetic. The House reauthorizing the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, otherwise known as FISA, despite growing privacy concerns, sending it onto the Senate now. Senator Rand Paul earlier demanding more privacy protections for Americans swept up in the surveillance of foreigners, threatening a filibuster. This happened earlier on America's Newsroom. If there was ever something worth filibustering, I think it would be filibustering for the Bill of Rights. What we have is a program called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and you're supposed to be, or the grant of power, is to spy on foreigners and foreign lands. I'm all for that. We need to protect our country. So there are a lot of innocent people who are in here, and it should not be searched for American data without a warrant. All we're asking is go to a judge and uh, have some evidence to get started. Warrants aren't that difficult to get. Joining us is Wisconsin Congressman Sean Duffy. He voted against reauthorization, which may come to the surprise of some. Why'd you vote against it? So, I'm, I'm somewhere between where Rand Paul and Justin Amash are on the FISA bill and where the House bill ended up. I'm more with a Jim Sensenbrenner. He was the author of the U.S. Patriot Act. Um, and what we want is to make sure that we have the technology to surveil would-be American citizen terrorists as they talk to foreigners. That's a good thing. Uh, but I think that we don't have 
have enough protections in for the average American citizen who could get caught up in this surveillance, requiring warrants to be had uh, in the FISA courts. Um, so we're protecting the Fourth Amendment per Rand Paul's comment. So I don't, I don't think we struck the right balance here. Um, we don't have enough protections in the bill. And uh, I, I think Rand Paul can uh, extract those modifications and changes if he threatens his filibuster, which I think is, is appropriate. And you heard Rand Paul threatening to, yeah. to filibuster. And our, our producer on Capitol Hill said, well, hold on, he, he might not necessarily be able to do that without getting into the weeds. Uh, if he, t he said if he takes up a lot of time on the floor after the procedural vote, that does not constitute a filibuster. That's just a really long speech. Um, so it, to get it, that it, out there. And I would note, too, that, that this has been a bipartisan bill. It, 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 though I voted against it, Republicans and Democrats out of the House supported it. So I imagine in the Senate, they'd have this 60 vote threshold to actually pass this bill with uh, both parties. Interesting. And the Wall Street Journal editorial board this morning uh, writes this quote There is no evidence that officials have abused Section 702, and there is multi layered oversight that includes top intelligence officials, Congress, and the FISA judges. But the danger is that a left right coalition in Congress will re re-erect barriers between intelligence agencies and law enforcement that led to the failure to detect the 9-11 yeah. plot, Congressman. No, no one wants to take away or, or re-erect re barriers. We want to make sure that our, our intelligence agencies can communicate and cooperate and keep us safe. Um, but again, do you, you want to make sure that you have uh, American citizens not getting caught up in, in FISA. And they might say, well, we haven't heard any evidence yet that this section has been violated or abused. Mm. Well, yeah, we don't hear it until we hear it, right? It's, it's, it's top secret mm -hmm. stuff. So um, that's why on the front end, we have to make sure we have the right protections in for, for law-abiding American citizens who are involved in these terrorist activities, all the while not erecting barriers uh, for our intelligence agencies to keep us safe. So I want to take a step back and look yeah. at this week, and it has been crazy. <laughs> It's been nuts. You said crazy. Well, you go back to the beginning of the week, and it looks so productive. This yeah. bipartisan meeting happening in the White House, the president, Democrats, Republicans, senators, congressmen, getting together, talking about immigration reform. It was an open dialogue, open yeah. conversation. Television, television cameras were in the room for 55 minutes. And then we come to the end of this week, and we've got this language dispute. Did the president say it? Did he not say it? And Dick Durbin says he said that nasty word talking about Haitians coming into the country and what do you think of all this? Listen, I, first of all, I think the president's frustrated. These, the the self-appointed group of senators, these, these six senators, half Republican, half Democrat, come with a deal to Donald Trump. They come to the Oval Office and it's a deal that gives Democrats everything on DACA and doesn't give the president, you know, 10% uh, of what he wanted with regard to border security. So you're security. in the president's camp that this Abs was a bad deal. It was a horrible deal. And so the president's frustrated. He starts pushing back, use language that I absolutely disagree with. I mean, you, you, you're the president. Whatever you say in the Oval Office or on TV, it's public and you'll be criticized for it. He can't say those things, especially with people who don't really like him uh, that were in that meeting. But the bottom line is we want to secure our border. And when you give us $1.6 billion, when it's going to take $18 billion to secure the border, um, we, he can't buy into that. And by the way, Senator, we talk about compassionate. We want Republicans and Democrats, we want to deal with the DACA kids. But we also don't want the next generation of DACA kids to come in um, and have to go with these DACA kids have gone through, which means secure the border, keep us safe. Um, get rid of chain migration. There's a deal to be had, uh, but it might get more difficult after the comments that came out of the White House. Congressman Duffy, always good to see you. And lovely you to see your wife, your beautiful wife on Fox and Friends this yeah. morning. She's joining you on our number today. Yes, so we'll see her then. All right, thanks so much. You got it. You heard so. a lot about the so-called dreamers. You're about to meet one in a moment. Many of them pinning their hopes on this immigration deal. Come on back, Red. Well, it'd certainly be the first presidential race of its kind. Oprah running against President Trump in 2020. That would be must-see TV. Here's the headline in Bernie Goldberg's new op-ed. Will she or won't she? Is he or isn't he? Goldberg says a mania is sweeping the nation of whether or not Oprah's running for the president and whether or not Donald Trump is mentally fit. You can check out his piece online at BernieGoldberg.com. How you doing, sir? Live in Miami today. I think you got the better the weather option between the two of us here today. You know, Bernie, right. take a step back. The product over the last year has been pretty good. You want to decimate ISIS, you do it. You want to put pressure on North Korea, you want to put pressure on Iran, you do it. The market's flying, the economy's good, unemployment's way down. But maybe the production of said product is one place where we can have an honest debate, which is apparently what's going on again today. Go. Well, the production of said product is that Donald Trump gets in the way of all the good news. Now, look, are there people in the media who want to play down the good news because they don't like him? Absolutely. But he gets in the way to the point that there's a mania 
sweeping Washington and beyond, and the mania isn't about whether he's fit for office. That ship has sailed. Liberal Democrats and more than a few Republicans think he's not fit for office. The mania comes down to, is he downright crazy? The lead editorial in the New York Times yesterday, the lead editorial, word for word, is Mr. Trump nuts? Then you have psychiatrists coming out of the woodwork who have never examined him, who have concluded that he's, he's, he's mentally unstable and he's dangerous. And then he pours fuel on the fire by, by tweeting these crazy things like, my nuclear button is bigger than little rocket man's nuclear button. That's why the, the production of the information is getting lost. It, it, the news is that the economy is better than ever, unemployment is low, consumer confidence is high, but as long as he contributes to this mania of, of whether or not he's crazy, it's not good for him, yeah. it's not good for the country. Um, you, you wrote about Oprah this week and the power of likability, and I think you probably make a point about that when it comes to politics, but I, I thought this quote from the Wall Street Journal interview from yesterday uh, was rather revealing. Here it is on screen. You see that a lot with me, and then all of a sudden somebody's my best friend. I could give you 20 examples. You give me 30. I'm a very flexible person. What does that say about the transactional nature of how this president approaches his job? Whether it's banging on Lindsey Graham a year and a half ago and now playing golf with him repeatedly. It, it says that he doesn't take things personally. Uh, that, that he could dish it out, he, and then when somebody dishes it back to him, he'll tweet about it and all that. But in the end, if you call him names but pass his tax policy, he's okay with that. But I'll tell you this, since you brought up Oprah and since I brought it up in the column, predictions are hard, especially when they're about the future. The great American philosopher Yogi Berra supposedly said that. But I'll make a prediction. If she decides to run, and she's a smart woman, and if she's as smart as I think, she won't run because she doesn't need the grief. But if she decides to run, I think she will win because Donald Trump won based on personality, not on policy. She could win the same way. And she has this likability. Likability, I think, is one of the most powerful forces in the entire universe. She's likable, maybe not to some of the people watching us now and other Trump supporters. But she's likable to ordinary Americans for whom politics is not a big deal. And if there were a Donald versus Oprah race in 2020, that would be pay-per-view stuff. <laughs> no question now, look, about it. You could raise a lot of money on that. I think she's running. I'm on record. We'll see whether or not in the end that happens. Thank really? You. Really? Yeah, yes, yes I, I, do believe, I do believe that is the case. Have a great weekend, okay? Bernie Goldberg you too, in Bill. Miami. Thank you, sir. Congresswoman Pelosi taking some heat after she calls tax reform bonuses to American workers crumbs. Is she out of touch with reality? Also, one woman becoming the victim of a heartbreaking scam targeting our men and women in uniform. I just got to the point where the debt overconsumed me and I'm left with nothing but shame. It has been our top story of the day. Democratic Senator Dick Durbin speaking out about whether or not President Trump actually made that vulgar comment yesterday during that immigration meeting. President Trump denies using that word. Senator Durbin was in the meeting, and here's what he said. When I mentioned that fact to him, he said, Haitians, do we need more Haitians? And then he went on when we started to describe the immigration from Africa that was being protected in this uh, bipartisan measure. That's when he used these vile and vulgar comments, calling the nations they come from the exact word used by the president, not more, not just once, but repeatedly. Uh, that was the nature of this conversation. When it came to the issue of, quote, chain migration, I said to the president, do you realize how painful that term is to so many people? Meanwhile, lots of uncertainty still when it comes to an actual immigration deal. President Trump rejecting a pitch from bipartisan senators trying to protect dreamers and increase border security. Many of those dreamers fear they could be deported. One of them is sharing her story with Casey Stiegel. He joins us now from Dallas. Hey, Casey.
Sandra, good morning to you. Nearly 690,000 people. Think about that number. That's how many currently live in this country and are receiving DACA benefits of some sort from the federal government. For context, that is more than the entire state of Vermont, and that is a large number. So lots of people on pins and needles over what President Trump or Congress will ultimately decide about DACA Make changes to it, end it all together. Norma Salazar, just one of about 113,000 DACA recipients watching from the sidelines here in Texas because this state, right behind California, has the second highest number of enrollees in the country. Salazar's mother brought her to the U.S. illegally from Mexico, but she was 10 years old at the time. Now 27, she's graduated from high school in Texas, paid for her own college education, now working an office job, married with three children. If DACA ends, she could be deported. If people could see uh, that, you know, we're human, we, we're not criminals. We, you know, we deserve a chance to be here. We, we are Americans. This is our home. But critics argue just the opposite, that they're not Americans because they didn't come here legally. And the time to stop using taxpayer money to fund it is now. Executive director at the Center of Immigration Studies tells me the DACA program is a giant financial burden on the U.S. economy. Exact figures of how much it costs really unclear, so we won't name them. But it's in the billions, education, health care, other expenditures. And while he says he has sympathy for people in situations, with children like Norma, but that doesn't give them a free pass, he contends. Having a U.S. born kid does not exempt you from the immigration laws, nor does it mean necessarily that your family is going to be separated because you simply take your child with you when you go home. There are thousands of U.S. citizen kids who are now in Mexico because their parents either went home voluntarily or were deported. So not an easy topic, clearly, and some of the stakes are quite high. To be continued, Sandra, back to you. Certainly. Casey Stiegel, thank you. Maybe it's a crumb if you live in Pacific Heights or in a Seacliff neighborhood of San Francisco and you're married to Paul Pelosi. Maybe then it's a crumb. But for most people, it's real money. And they say, by the way, that Trump doesn't have uh, both oars in the water. Nancy's lost the oars and can't even find the water. She's so out of it. <laughs> Laura Ingram last night blasting the House Minority Leader. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, after she called tax reform bonuses given American workers crumbs. They are mere crumbs, Leslie Marshall. Syndicated radio host and Fox News contributor Steve Hilton, host of the New York Next Revolution with Steve Hilton. How are you guys doing on a Friday? They, they are mere crumbs. Um, I don't know, Leslie, if you're making 80 grand in Ohio and you're raising four kids and you're going to get $2,000 a year in your pocket, I think most Americans would take that. What do you say? Well, I say we have to look at the net gain, okay? And that's what my accountant tells me. If you don't have the personal deductions that you have been able to take in the past and you get some in February back, but it's not in the hundreds, and then you do a cross-reference as to how much you're losing as opposed to how much you're gaining, well, if you gain 50 bucks or 75 bucks in February, that's helpful. To some, that is crumbs when later you actually, in a net, get less because you don't have those itemized deductions or personal deductions that you had in I the think past. I got that. So I don't think her, I think her word I think her wording is insensitive. I think her wording is insensitive, but I don't think she's really wrong. Well, well, let him eat cake. Steve Hilton, what do you make of what appears to many to be a condescending remark about the, the, the state of the economy for many Americans, everyday folks? It's so elitist, Bill. I mean, that, that's exactly what it is, condescending. And it doesn't recognize the fact that anything that's more money in your pocket is desperately needed after decades, literally decades, where for most working people, their incomes have been going down. And people are going to benefit from this tax bill, not just from uh, the actual tax change, but from the impact it has on the overall economy. You're already seeing wages going up in a way that hasn't been seen literally for decades. But there's a broader political point here, which is that it's Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats are desperate for this tax reform to fail. 
good news for the American worker is bad news for Democrats. So they're going to be keep repeating this line about the tax bill not having any impact. But it doesn't matter what they say. The real impact will be felt by American workers in their pockets, regardless yeah. of these yeah. stupid yeah. comments. It's an interesting makes. point that Steve makes. Right? Leslie, I don't see anybody giving that money back. <laughs> if you can find that person, we'll put them on TV. Well, certainly, and the working class has as many Democrats, if they do Republicans, perhaps even more. Uh, that, that I, I don't agree with Steve. I'm a Democrat. I certainly want us to have a robust economy, no matter who is in the Oval Office, whether I voted for them or not. And I wouldn't give the money back. But the problem is, if I, like I said, if I'm getting $50 in February, uh, but then later in the year, I'm ac actually having to pay more uh, because of the tax code. And let's, and let's not just uh, dismiss how confusing this is. This was supposed to be more simple. So will those people really get it back? You do some things easier online than you. for others. You revert back to the I'm old telling, form. I'm I telling think it's young just Americans, as, uh, if you got an idea confusing. for a small business, start it because you're going to make a lot of money down the road because of this tax plan. <laughs> now on London, quickly on screen from the tweet. Reason I canceled my trip to London is that I'm not a big fan of the Obama administration. Having sold perhaps the best located and finest embassy in London for peanuts, only to build a new one in an off location for $1.2 billion. Bad deal. Wanted me to cut ribbon. No. So he will not go, Steve, although I think the decision was made by Bush 43. Um, what is the state of our relationship with London at this point? Look, first of all, I, you know, I'm, I'm very happily living in California now, Bill, so I'm not an expert on the latest moves in the London property market. Okay. So whatever the real reason, I think that it's a very good idea for the president not to go because at the moment, whatever the relationship between Theresa May and the president, and I think basically you have a few ups and downs over the odd tweet, but it's a strong relationship that will endure. He's really unpopular with British people. And if the president went to London at this point, all it would be would be an excuse for a huge demonstration. It wouldn't really do any good. And so I think he's very smart to stay away. Uh, Leslie, you got a thought on that? He loves big crowds, though, Steve. You know, maybe he should go just for that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, look, I, I, I'm not British, and I don't have the lovely accent that Steve and uh, so many others have from the U.K. But, no, he's not liked. Everything I heard and saw on uh, the, the media this morning over the pond uh, was, we hate the bloke. Uh, and, and they do. But I don't agree with Steve. I think, actually, that's one of the reasons he should go, because some people say he in person is charming. I don't know. I haven't met the president uh, in person. And also because he has said some very disparaging things about London's mayor, who also happens to be a Muslim, I think this would be an opportunity uh, for the president to uh, take the high road and to show that perhaps some of his tweets or that no. his bark is not as bad for as For now, bite. it's been rescheduled. Leslie, have a great weekend, okay? Steve Hilton, Leslie Marshall there. You Thanks too. to both of you. Nice to have you on, Sandra. A story we've been following, an engineer fired by Google, now suing for discrimination. He'll join us next to lay out his case. To disparage, smear, belittle, bully, discriminate conservatives and white men. That's not acceptable. It has been a story that we have been following former Google engineer James Damore. He was fired after writing a memo that slams the company as an ideological echo chamber. He has now filed a class action lawsuit claiming the tech giant discriminates against conservatives and white men. James Damore joins us now along with civil rights attorney Harmeet Dillon. Thanks to both of you for coming on this morning and telling your story. Happy to be here. Thanks a lot. So James, in your lawsuit, you allege what about discrimination? So I went to several diversity programs and they all told me the same thing that they are actually taking race and gender into account when they're hiring, which is illegal. And that is serving to benefit women and non-conservatives and non-whites? And non-Asians. And what is your evidence of this? I, I will turn to your, to your attorney here in a minute, but what is the evidence that you are laying out uh, to prove your case that Google is discriminating against white male conservatives. So, Sandra, uh, you know, there are women included in the case as well. If they're conservative and they're women, they can be plaintiffs in this case. The evidence is throughout our uh, very lengthy and detailed complaint. It's uh, 161 pages long, and it includes a number of screenshots from managers at Google who 
um, talk about uh, men and white people being toxic and, and toxic masculinity, et cetera. Um, we have an anecdote in there about two very senior female managers at Google leading an all-hands meeting at which business units that had not enough women in them were booed. And, um, you know, there are other incidents of harassment. And Google maintains blacklists uh, among various managers of people who are conservative, people who voted for the president. And they also threaten to blacklist people throughout Silicon Valley if their views don't conform with the very extreme left-wing views of some of those managers. Google's so we have a lot of evidence. Google's responded with a pretty uh, general uh, statement on all of this on your lawsuit, James, saying, quote, we look forward to defending against Mr. DeMoore's lawsuit in court. I must point out that uh, Google uh, disproportionately employs males. When you look at the global environment, 69 percent of Google's workforce is male, 56 percent of domestic employees are white. Doesn't that work against your case, James? Uh, if, if I can jump in and then James can add, but the fact, of the, the fact that they don't have, um, uh, you know, uh, th th those numbers are not relevant. The numbers that are relevant are how are they getting to 50-50? Those are their goals. And if they're using quotas, that's not legal. If they're using recruiting and other ways to do it, as James has pointed out um, in some other uh, interviews, only 20% of the engineers out of software school these days in the United States are women. So if you want 50-50, you're going to have to do that with some very aggressive efforts. James, some people responded, and I'm sure you can weigh in on all the response you're getting and to continue to get on this, which I, I'm sure is a lot. But the initial letter that you wrote while you were still employed by the company, which then you were fired for, for, for writing, uh, you talked about the alienation of conservatives at the company, but you also blamed biological differences for the relative lack of women in technology. As a result, you don't have to look far to find people who are saying you're, you're against women and don't think that they're as good as men in the technology workplace. No, I never say that women uh, are worse at all. Actually, they are just as good. It's just that uh, fewer women tend to be interested in technology, which leads to men and women choosing different uh, things for their career. And I actually lay out several ways in which we can make the workplace more welcoming for women to actually increase the gender diversity at Google without illegal discrimination. What is the response that you're getting today uh, to all of this? It's really a mix of just blind hate and uh, a lot of support, though, because this isn't just happening at Google. This is. In many workplaces, people can really empathize with uh, this just shutting down of uh, conservative thought and uh, of illegal discrimination. Were you surprised uh, at, the, at the initial reaction from Google to fire you for writing this letter? Yeah, I was very surprised, actually, because if you read it, it's clear that I was trying to help Google. And they just wouldn't have any of it. And they just smeared me and fired me. Well, clearly, Harmeet, you've taken him on as a client. You believe he has a case. Do you believe he can win? Yes, I do. I don't take cases that I don't think have merit. And it's not just James. There are uh, dozens of other people's stories included in our lawsuit. Uh, I've gotten overwhelming response since Monday when we filed it. A lot of people are calling us to join the lawsuit, including a lot of people who were interviewed for jobs but didn't get jobs at Google because of their gender, their race or their political viewpoint. And you know, this is a much bigger issue than just Google. It's throughout Silicon Valley. All right. Thanks to both of you for coming on, Harmeet and James, for telling your story. We'll have more in just a moment. A registered nurse looking for online, looking online rather for a relationship, gets scammed instead. And the man she thought she was talking to, a member of the U.S. military, is also a victim. Douglas Kennedy sorts that for us today. A friend had told me about an app that was fun, that gave you a huge amount of attention at 40 her life had become unsatisfying and so when she received a private message with this man's photo she responded so this photo and the photos that followed really held some promise for you uh, yes we were going to have a life together she is a registered nurse in a western state we are disguising her identity because she's afraid the man who sent her the photo was not the man in the photo and ended up scamming her out of $50,000. He ended up with your personal information, your personal photos, and to this day he's threatening to release this if you expose him. 
I loved this person, so yes, he got pictures too. The FBI says love scams comprise some of the fastest growing crime on the internet. They say over a billion dollars was taken from people looking for love in the wrong place and with the wrong person. More often than not, that wrong person appears to be a man in uniform. According to this Facebook page, military romance scams compiles hundreds of photos of military men whose photos have been stolen. Men like Gabe Finelli. So your photos have been used to scam not only our nurse, but dozens of people. I mean, I get maybe 10 messages a week even asking me, hey, do you remember talking to me on this website or that website? And it's not me. In fact, his photos are a treasure trove for scammers who simply cut and paste his life to create an alternative life, one that 